Um, welcome back. We continue our reading of Bhagavad Gita. I think we should call it the Guru Kripa edition of Bhagavad Gita because we've been researching the idea that the driving force uh, behind Bhagavad Gita is, is prema, divine love. And that, and that the source of this divine love, the energy, is the Radharani. And we've been searching for signs of this in the text that we've read so far. And I say Guru Kripa because our access to divine love is by Guru Kripa, by the mercy of, of our Guru. So I want to make a strong statement about that, maybe not too strong, but relatively strong. And that is that Bhagavad Gita is meaningful for us because our Guru Dev, Guru Dev has brought this meaning to us. He's researched this meaning, this source of prema, and he's taught me about it. And then he's given me the task of continuing this research. So really, when I read Bhagavad Gita, I'm seeing Gurudev, or maybe Guru Manjari. I'm seeing her, Guru Manjari, in the text collecting knowledge, collecting experience, helping me, helping us to understand. So she, Guru Manjari, is helping to show the path towards understanding divine love, prema, in ourselves, not out there in the sky somewhere, but in ourselves. And this idea that divine love is in us because we are part and partial of God. This is an idea that we talked about before when we talked about confidential knowledge. when we talked about secret knowledge. This knowledge we said is not knowledge that comes from books and speeches and texts, but it's knowledge that passes through the energy of prema. So everywhere we can find the energy of prema in Bhagavad Gita, we can find the path to the meaning of Bhagavad Gita. And this brings us back to the matter of parampara that we also talked about quite a bit. It's not only to be respectful that we acknowledge parampara, though it's that too. It's not just symbolic that we pay our respects to our parampara. It's really practical. We need them. We need them. They're not ghosts. They're not old symbols of the past. Our parampara is alive in all the senses of the word alive, except for the, the plastic body sense of alive. In all the senses of the word, they're alive. 
they're with us in our readings, except for the plastic body, which of course is the least important. Adelaide, sorry for interruption. Yes. And please set the Russian translator for a Russian people devotees. Okay. I make I made Brother Charan das, but now Kavin Mohini is back. So make Kavin Mohini. Radhe Radhe Govind Mohini. Sorry for interruption. Radhe Charan, we just у меня ну у меня проблема техническая была. Переводить или нормально? А, не слышно, не слышно в канале перевода. Вы будете продолжать переводить? А, окей. He say he will continue. Sorry, sorry for interruption. I had the technical problems. Well, I can in interrupt you interrupting me by saying that I'm very happy that the Russian brothers and sisters are there. We have such a very special uh, uh, sharing uh, every week on the on the Saturday morning sharing with the Russians and they're really I feel like they're very close to us. So thank you for being there and thank for the translation work. So the to the parampara, I was just finishing, I just wanted to mention that before we actually recognize them, that that we need them in a very real and practical way, uh, in the sense that they will they'll show us the way to the to the prema, to the, the spiritual path to the prema, and that's exactly what we need when we're when we're reading. So let's remember, as we've done before, our, our dear Gurudev Sadhu Maharaj and Gurudev's Gurudev, Radha Govinda Das Babaji Maharaj, Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada, of course, <clears throat> the author of the translation and of the commentaries, the Goswamis, the great philosopher Rupa Goswami, and Raghunath, who puts into life the, the message of Bhakti and Prabhupananda uh, Saraswati as well. We remember Anantaras Babaji, the amazing poet of our Bhakti movement, and of course Chaitanya, Mahaprabhu, and Radha right. Mohan. We remember the Acharyas who have helped along the way. And then lastly, our spiritual family, the Vaishnavas, who are sharing today and who are also absolutely necessary to what we're doing. I couldn't be here if you were not here. I need your love just as much as I want to give you my own love. We've already talked about a few concepts that will come back again and again, so I want to mention them. Obviously, Prema is a main idea that we, we're, we're tracking, we're mapping in Bhagavad Gita, and we're asking how we find it, what it looks like, what form it takes in a book like Bhagavad Gita, and what bhakti means in relation to it. We talked a lot about association and about how we find the spiritual meaning of Bhagavad Gita by the looking for the way it passes from one heart to another, from one association to another. We talked about finding our svarup, our, our constitutional position, our spiritual identity, as a matter of that as being the place from which we can clearly look around us and, and, and clearly see the spiritual relations and the and the divine love. We talked a lot about flow, flow of the divine. And we talked last week about the secret, about what the secret is. And we talked uh, about the difference between a secret as a fact, that the card is an eight of hearts or not, the difference between the fact and the secret which cannot be revealed, the secret what secret that, that has to be experienced, the secret of spiritual knowledge, the secret of love, which is never factual, which can never just be said, but which, which must, must be um, felt. 
And this idea of secret then taught us something special about Bhagavad Gita. Because Bhagavad Gita has two books. <clears throat> For most people, really, Bhagavad Gita is a very nice book about philosophy. An ordinary book about philosophy. A very good one. Tells us about Indian philosophy. Tells us about psychology. Tells us about theology. Cosmology. There's lots of information we can, we can gather there. It's very much based on the Upanishads you might know, and it's a very clear explanation of the philosophy of, of, of Indian tradition in many ways. But on the other hand, and for very few readers, it's an extraordinary book. And I hope we count as those readers. It's an extraordinary book in the sense that it's an introduction to bhakti. It's an introduction to loving devotion, to what cannot be said in philosophy about loving devotion. It shows um, the path towards the practice of loving devotion. So while we need the, and we want the psychology, the theology, the cosmology, the philosophy about the nature of God and the universe. There's a very big and very important difference between philosophy and bhakti. And this book can also show us that difference if we are sensitive to it. Bhagavad Gita has meaning in, meaning in its words, of course, but it contains something much more valuable and that's what's between the lines, if you like, behind the lines. It's in the ink. It's in the beauty of the, the words that's not verbal. It's the energy. It's the way it makes us feel. It's the way it makes us act. The way it moves our hearts. The way it touches our relations with others. There's divine love in the text, and we can, we can feel it if we open our hearts and minds to it. Every word, I'll go a bit far and say that every word in Bhagavad Gita contains a trace of bhav, a trace of feeling. There's no mathematical word, naked, dry, dark in Bhagavad Gita. Behind the words, there's feeling, there's bhav, there's emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence. It's that message that's not carried to our minds, to our intellect, but that's carried to our heart. So the sensitive reader will find both. It's, an, it's a magic book, and I even thought of the comparison with a kind of Harry Potter book. You can imagine a Harry Potter book and you open it up and when your eye falls on a word, then you could smell the word too. Something like this would be right out of Harry Potter. Right? And that's what we have. We read the text and we feel the fragrance of the word, words. And all the fragrances of all the words make up a bouquet of fragrances. A bouquet of <clears throat> And that's, if you like, that's the bhav of the book. That's what we find in, in Bhagavad Gita. So that's what I want to find. I want you to help me to find, and with Gurudev's help, we'll find it together. When we read the book, we, we assume that bhav. We absorb it. It comes into us, into our hearts and souls, and then we pass it on to our loved ones, to our friends, to our students and, and co-workers, and everybody in our life. It's like a vibration, Bob. It's like a vibration. And actually, Prabhupada often made the comparison of the Maha Mantra with a vibration. It's, it's vibrating with the frequency of the universe, with the frequency of God. And that's why we do it when we even compare it to a radio station. 
radio signal that you have the frequency of the universe is vibrating away. And when we tune into that vibration, then we are resonating with um, the universe. Yeah. So there's a, our spiritual body and the vibration we have in our own souls and the spiritual body, which is Bhagavad Gita, which is vibrating. And what we're trying to do is bring them into, bring them into, um, what should I say, harmony, harmonize them. And I even, just for fun, I brought you a picture of a tuning fork. Yeah, there it is. Just a moment. Let's do this seamlessly and elegantly. There it is. Well, several tuning forks, actually. And you could see, for those of you who don't know what a tuning fork is, these are very high tech. They're very carefully made. They're very, very precise. And you can see written on the tuning fork, each tuning fork is a frequency. Um, just need to get the picture there for myself. So the big one is 128 megahertz or hertz, 256 hertz and so on and so forth. And uh, musicians and musical technicians, they use these to tune instruments. So you bang it on, on a hard surface and it vibrates in a very, very pure vibration and it makes a sound. But what's beautiful about tuning forks, aside from being physically beautiful, I hope you agree with me, is that if you have two of the same frequency, so let's take that big one on the right, and I, I hold one and I give the other one to Punyam at the other end of the room and I bang mine on the table and it starts to vibrate. The one in Punyam's hand will vibrate too. Miraculously. It's a beautiful thing to see. It will start vibrating and will start making the same sounds, same tone, same musical note that mine is. And this is what's happening between our soul and Bhagavad Gita, between our soul and the universe, between our soul and God. There's a vibration which is specific to us. Maybe we're 156 hertz, maybe we're 250 hertz. Whatever it is, it can be tuned into the vibration of the universe. That's the tuning fork. You'll never forget now. Where does Bhav come from? We talk so much about Bhav. Everything okay? Bhav, that feeling, that deep, rich, pure, spiritual feeling, it comes from prema, from divine love. It's, it's spiritual, it's divine. And it comes to us through Guru. So it comes from Guru Prema. Bhagavad Gita is, in this sense, the manifestation of Guru, our Guru, the Parampara, in, in, in the pages of the book. So if we understand the book at all, and I think we do a little bit, it's because we understand the Bhav, that we absorb the Bhav, that we take it into us and we can make it part of our lives. So Guru, Guru Manchari, the Bhav is hiding in the words, and this is what we're trying to release, if you like, trying to, to find. And I think that every place we look for Guru Manjari in the text will we'll find her. So paradoxically, this is a very strange thing to say, but listen carefully. Reading Bhagavad Gita, reading a holy text, is not reading the words. Reading a holy text like Bhagavad Gita doesn't start when we look at the words with open eyes. It starts when we shut our eyes and look inside ourselves. Reading, spiritual reading, doesn't happen when we look at the words. It begins when we open our eyes and look up, close our eyes and look up from the page and look into ourselves. We close our eyes, we soften our hearts, we settle into our spiritual identities, and there we read and we see everything we did.
Now I want to go back to the text. Oh yes, the text before we forget. And we left it behind on verse 9.3, chapter nine, verse three which I promised you was going to be about faith. And I'll put it up on the screen here and we'll look at it together. And I think, there it is. Oops, that was verse four. Let's look at verse three, here it is. Verse 3, nine. 9, chapter 9, verse 3. Now look carefully. Those who are not faithful on the path of devotional service cannot attain me. O conqueror of foes, but return to birth and death in this material world world so if you don't attain god you'll you'll continue in in the the cycle of birth and death you won't find liberation this is the clear if you like explicit surface meaning of the text that's the philosophical meaning of the text but let's look a little bit more more closely it talks about faith and faithfulness the word ashradad there you see it in the first in the first uh, line of, of the verse. Ashradad means faith. So those who are not with faith are the ones who won't, won't find the path. But the answer, I hope you're asking the question yourself like me, faith in what? Faith in what? It doesn't say. Now, I'm not a perfect expert in Sanskrit, but the commentaries I've read say that it's asya, this other word a little bit farther down, which says of it, faith of it or in it. And the faith we're talking about is prema, faith in divine love. Those who are not faithful to divine love, who do not have belief in divine love on the path of devotional service cannot attain me. So it's not faith in existence of Krishna, it's faith in the love that animates Krishna, the energetic love behind Krishna, and this is the love of Radharani. The faith we're talking about in the text is faith in the love energized by Radharani. So let's see what that means for the purport. Prabhupada writes, the faithless cannot accomplish this process of devotional service. Devotional service already gives us a strong clue that we're talking about love, but it's not said in directly, explicitly in the, in the verse. Of course, how could we possibly do devotional service without love? Love, divine love, is the precondition for doing service of a devotional kind. That is the purport of the verse, says Prabhupada. And going on then, he says, well, faith is created by association with devotees. Once again, faith in what? Faith in prema. So faith in prema, belief in prema, is created by having loving association with devotees. Obviously, the more we associate with devotees who have love in their hearts, the more we'll believe in the strength of the prema. The, the, the more we'll understand and realize that the energy behind the entire, the entire process is one given by love. And for that reason, I say it's one that's given by Radharani. When the more we associate with devotees, the more our love strengthens, the love drawn from other devotees, the love given to other devotees. And that's what increases our, creates, to use Prabhupada's word, and then strengthens our faith. Unfortunate people, who are those? 
those are the ones who don't have faith, even after hearing all the evidence of Vedic literature from great personalities, still have no faith in God. Why? Because Vedic literature precedes Mahaprabhu, precedes the discovery of Manjari Bhav, precedes the insertion of Bhav in our tradition. And so this experience of God as an experience of loving relation, devotee to Guru, is not possible until Mahaprabhu. So the purely, if you like, philosophical relationship to Vedic literature will remain just one of a religious scholar. Someone sitting in a library bent over a Vedic, a book of the Vedas, sorting through the, the verses, trying to understand what it means without any faith in God, meaning without any faith in divine love. I continue, Prabhupada continues rather. <laughs> They are hesitant and cannot stay fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Of course, because they don't have prema. They don't have this energy, the tool, the very powerful tool, which is prema, in order to develop a relationship, develop Krishna consciousness, which is based on a relationship, a loving relationship, not only to God, but to other devotees. Prabhupada continues, in Chaitanya Charita Tamrita, it is said that one should have complete conviction that simply by serving the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, he can achieve all perfection. This is very similar we can read this in a philosophical way and just think, well, I commit to serving Lord Krishna. I will do everything I'm supposed to do. I can follow the dharma, I can follow the rules, the regulations, the rituals. But if we understand the service, serving the Supreme Lord as one of loving service, one that's driven by love, by prema, one that's devotional, this brings us to a different kind of perfection, a perfection in, in, in bhakti. That is called real faith. So not faith in God, faith in prema. The real faith is the faith in divine love. Srimad Bhagavatam, it stated, that by giving water to the root of a tree, its branches, twigs, and leaves become satisfied. And I emphasize satisfied there for a reason. It comes many times, you see, three times in the next verse, in the next sentence. What is satisfaction? Satisfaction comes from a longing, a hunger, a thirst. It comes from a greed, loba, we say in the bhakti tradition in Sanskrit. It comes from a desire for feeling. Think of the difference between desire for water when we're thirsty and desire for feeling when we're longing spiritually. One is material, the other is spiritual. This metaphor here is written in a material way, but we should understand it in a spiritual way. It's written with the example of a tree. You put water, the tree grows. But the life that we're talking about is the desire in our hearts, the desire for love, the desire to love, the desire to be loved, and the model for this is the love of Radharani. And the love we aspire to 
is the divine love, prema. So satisfaction is both a spiritual satisfaction in our world, and in this example, a material satisfaction. Let's remember to bring in the spiritual meaning of the word. It lifts us out of this material understanding of the text and help us to understand the devotional under the meaning of the, the text. So by supplying food to the stomach, all the senses of the body become satisfied. And similarly, by engaging transcendental service of the Supreme Lord, all the demigods and all the living entities automatically become satisfied. So even here, the demigods are, of course, material. The demigods are living beings, half spiritual, if you like. But this satisfaction we're looking for, and what this describes for us, is spiritual satisfaction. So Prabhupada goes on, after reading Bhagavad Gita, one should promptly come to the conclusion, promptly, quickly, of Bhagavad Gita, one should give up all other engagements and adopt the service of Supreme Lord Krishna, personality of Godhead. The service, once again, can be understood in a material way, but we want to understand it in a spiritual way. Devotional service, serving with our hearts, serving through love. Uh, when we're doing material service, doing it in a spirit of love. And there's one last clue in this sentence. It's the emphasis of personality of Godhead. Prabhupada, as you know, always uses this expression, personality of Godhead. He doesn't talk about God. When he says Bhagavan, he means personality. And this means that God is a loving, individual, personal entity that, 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 uh, whose expansions are expansions of love into the universe, into the world, and who accepts devotion in the form of love. Every time we see personality of God, that we should remember how much Prabhupada argues against the impersonal conception of God, the Mayavedi perception of God, because he argues that we jivas, we individual souls, have also personality, spiritual personalities. We're also souls, and that's the heart of our existence. If one is convinced of this philosophy, philosophy of life, he says, that is faith. Once again, faith in love. It's not just a philosophy of the universe. It's not just mm, astrophysics. It's a philosophy of, of pain. Now the development of that faith in the process of Krishna consciousness. I want to come back in a minute and talk to you about faith. We'll, we'll finish this paragraph, I think. Actually, I think we'll, we'll take a pause there because I want to say a few things about, about faith my, myself and, and, and what it means and, 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 and how it corresponds to this idea about, about faith uh, and prema. Faith is a very strange thing. I hope you'll agree with me, that faith is a very strange kind of knowing. It's a kind of knowledge, isn't it? Mm. It's knowledge that we can't know. It's knowledge that's somehow beyond us. It's a kind of knowing without knowing. It's knowing there's something there, but we don't know what it is. We believe that something's there, but we cannot say exactly what it is. Not with our intellect, I guess not with our minds, not with our brains. Knowing through faith, knowing as faith, comes through different means, doesn't it? It comes through non-intellectual means. It comes through spiritual means. It comes through spiritual feeling. It comes through bhav. 
knowing something through faith means knowing it because we feel it. It's not part of our deduction, our intellectual deduction. Faith is a different kind of knowing. And in order to feel in this spiritual way, we need to apply our souls. It's because of our souls, thanks to our souls. It's knowing um, as a kind of feeling, knowing as spiritual experience. We can feel it. When we have faith, it's not in the books. It's something we experience. We experience this energy, something which is opening us to the possibility of, of that thing we have faith in. We feel the truth of it. We cannot know it, again, intellectually, but we feel it. And we feel that it's true. Yeah, um, let me turn on your microphone there. Uh, just one moment, a commentary is coming. You can hear me? Govinda Makini, you can hear me? Вот, yeah. вот это чувство веры, да, сродни, он говорит, что like to, uh, как бы, да, about faith. восприятие без мозгов, um, любовь ребенка к матери. So nice what you explain about the faith, and I can uh, see that uh. the, the foundation of our faith is given by our first masters, gurus, and these are our parents when we are small children. If they take care so much nicely, our mother in the first month, she is our relative, the only one, right Gurudev? And uh, if she takes nicely care of us, the child is unlimited faithful in the mother, right? And there, even Mr. Freud, <laughs> he checked this. Uh, wie heißt das? Uh, mit System, systematically. Sigmund, our good friend Sigmund, he checked this. Uh, he makes some studies about this. And uh, he found out that uh, our lifelong phase started in the face to the mother and father. So parents are our first gurus, and they put this face in our hearts. And this is what I what comes in my mind now. Uh, to understand that if we don't get it in the early years, we have a problem, a lifelong, to get the faith. And now we see how important our first gurus are, right? Buddha, what you say? You see, they give the foundation. Mm. And because of this, it is said that the parents are like the gurus. Like, even like God themselves. No? So it's about, about faith. We start as babies. No understand any word. But faith is, they put in our heart, like what you say in the Parampara, our Gurudev put the bath in our heart. We spoke some days ago. Even faith is putting in our heart by this gurus, our mothers and fathers. Okay. Thank you. That I like to add. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And there's one other aspect about faith I wanted to mention before moving, moving on. And that's about the energy, the energy of, of faith. Little, little, sorry, Papa. Little. 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 Little.
ребенка, да. Я хотел бы, знаете, как э, до, дополнить, что это не нечто нам принесенное, это же в нас есть. Это естественно, но знаете, как э, с первых дней, да, ребенок же он верит, то, то есть мама дает грудь, и он же, он берет вообще без спроса. Я на своих девчонках маленьких, я им давал кусок земли и говорил, что это шоколадка, и они ели. Ну, то есть они верят, безусловно, то есть она внутри. Эта вера, она внутри, ну, изначально она в нас заложена. Ну, мне, вот мое ощущение, и как бы я, я свое детство вспоминаю. И, да? То есть это же как бы это не, не нечто, как про Пупада говорил, не нечто, навязанное уму. И да, вот лучше пример осознания, вот прочувствовать это, это вспомнить свое детство. То есть мы верили маме, безусловно, бездоговорочно. Рады, рады, сори. Now we have two Russian speakers here. Uh, Rade, Rade, Rade Govinda also wants to share. And actually, actually he's saying that, Gaura Sundara, that you, like, how to say, catching the same idea. Uh, he also uh, wants, uh, wanted to share that it's 100% that we have this face already inside. And... Um, We have this from from the early childhood because he had he has two daughters and when they were babies when they were small uh, he gave them a piece of earth and said that oh it's like it, it's a chocolate and they were so faithful that they just took from their father without any hesitation so he's saying that for sure this face is already in us We're faithful, faithful by the, our nature, as uh, Prabhupada is saying. So he's very like in one tune with you. He's agree. Also, he wants to share a little bit with this. Rade, Rade. Thank you. Um, what was I saying? So the, I also wanted to point out that there's a there's a kind of energy in, in faith. The, the longing for knowledge, the long the wanting to know. Um, an attraction, if you like. There's a desire in, in faith. Mm. This knowledge is something we, we we're longing for, we're desiring, we're wanting it, we're attracted to it. We have agreed for it. So it's kind of a magic, magnetic force that draws us to the thing that we have faith in. And we're ready to take risks for it, you know? like eating dirt for your parents. Uh, we're ready to, if you like, make sacrifices for it or to pay a price. We'll walk a thousand kilometers for something we have faith in or climb a mountain. Or... And if you agree with me there, then we can ask, what, what is that? What is that that pulls us? What is that force? What is that energy? And I hope you agree with me again when I say, of course, it's love. It's love that's drawing us towards that knowledge that we don't have yet. That thing that we only have a spiritual relationship to. It's non-academic knowledge, non-philosophical knowledge. It's only a spiritual link we have. And what draws us is this energy of love. So this is linked, if you remember from this is what links us to uh, the secret that we talked about last week, secret knowledge or um, Confidential knowledge was the expression Prabhupada used. Somehow, we want the secret. We know it's out there. We know that the answer to the secret is out there. Even if we don't know what it is. And the desire to know, to know God, to know the inner heart of our lover, our mother, our sister, our brother, That is what powers the universe. That is what makes us live. So divine love is the top secret. The secret at the top. 
that we feel without knowing, that we long for without even any guarantee that we'll arrive. So somehow there's a trust that like uh, Govinda Mohini was saying, there's some sort of divine suspicion or spark that we, that makes us think that it's true. And we can see it almost immediately. And when we come back to bhakti, this is the function of the, of the lila, of the rasa lila, of the divine lila. It's showing us what prema looks like without us yet experiencing it. It's planting that seed in our hearts, which gives us the energy, the will, the longing to continue in our practice so that we can become closer to it. The divine lila, the rasa lila, it's not just in the book, in the books. It's going on in our hearts. That's why we're so attracted to it. We don't have to go anywhere and see it. We don't have to take a bus or a train. We don't need to buy a book or go to cinema. It's in our heart. It's happening in that little bit of Goloka inside of us, that little part and parcel of Goloka. Goloka is not on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. It's also in our hearts. And so when we read the Lila, we feel um, a connection. Uh, to it. It involves us. We matter in it. Tiny, tiny bit, yes, but we matter. We make a difference in it. All we have to do, all we have to do, it's not easy. We have to take the hand of our guru and let him show the path by reading together, by talking together, by associating so Guru helps us to close this gap between what we know and what we have faith in, between what we know and what we feel. So faith is not the practice of bringing knowledge this way, come on, or get closer, you know, take the airplane, take the train. It's a matter of nurturing the divine inside us, becoming familiar with our own svarup, with our own spiritual self, with the divine in us. This is what the spiritual path is. When we talk about a path, we, we think of a, a trail going up into the, the Swiss Alps somewhere that goes very, very high, and finally you come to God. But no, it's not this. It's the, it's the path towards becoming our spiritual selves. No, that's what true knowing has to look like, I, I think, so then I want to finish with this reflection. I'm sorry it's uh, going on. But then what are the signs of what does faith look like? Right? Well, um, um, how do we recognize what we're looking for? Well, we see it in our guru, number one. But we see it in others. We see it in the eyes of those we associate with. We see it in the eyes of our lovers, our parents, our friends, our associates. We see that spark in their eyes. Just walk down the street, look at a perfect stranger and think to yourself, let me observe the, the divine in this person and you will see it. So we see it in the faces, we see it in the touch, we hear it in their voices, we sing it, we speak it in their songs and their poems we smell it in the fragrance of the world we taste it in the prasad and we observe it in the pastimes of our guru all these things are signs of of the divine they 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 animate and nurture our our faith they give us the feeling that this faith is a not an empty promise, that somehow it's the hand of Radharani reaching into our lives to, to, to take us out and pull us forward. Yeah. That uh, this promise will, 
will be realized. It's not just a suspicion, a vague suspicion. It's something that's that's um, really quite quite real. Um, now I want to, and I'm going to finish soon, so we can open the, so we can uh, share or discuss if if you like. I want to go back to verse four and show you something very interesting in verse four, in the purport. The verse itself says, by me and in my unmanifested form, this entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. It's a bit of a riddle, which I don't want to spend lots of time on, but, but you could say that Krishna created the universe in an unmanifested way, so you don't see him, so he's not there. He created the structure of the universe, and then he fills part of it. He goes into it afterwards, but then, so beings are not in me, but I am not, uh, beings are in me inside this structure, but I am not in them. It's a bit of a philosophical point, which isn't what we want to talk about. What I want to talk to you about is this reference to the Brahma Sanita. So if we go to the third sentence of the purport here, Prabhupada writes, only to one who is engaged in pure devotional service under proper guidance is he, God, revealed. And then he says, in the Brahma Samhita, it is stated, Premanjana Churita, etc., etc. One can see the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Govinda, always within himself and outside himself. If he has developed the transcendental loving attitude towards him. Now, what's so special about this text? Well, some of you will know that the Brahma Samhita is a very old text, about as old as the Upanishads, some people say. It's not, it's not really clear when it's from, but uh, in the first millennium before the modern era, before Christ, as we say in the West. So thousands of years before Prabhupada, uh, sorry, uh, Mahaprabhu comes. And this text was rediscovered, or part of the text, one of the chapters of the text was discovered by Mahaprabhu. This was one of his leelas, if you like. He was very interested in this text because it describes 2,000 years before his time the relationship between Krishna and Radha. And so when he found this text, this fragment of the text, it became a very big deal, and he was the one who then made it popular. Like, oh, and I actually put it on a, on a slide to show you what it says, because it's very, very interesting. So let's stop that one. Mm, there it is. Have a look. There. So this is chapter 5, verse 38. There was only the one chapter that was recovered that uh, Mahaprabhu found. But it says the following on the bottom. There is a translation actually by um, Saraswati, who is the guru of Prabhupada. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is Shyama Sundara. Krishna himself, with inconceivable, innumerable attributes, whom the pure devotees see in their heart of hearts, with the eye of devotion tinged with the salve of love. So what's really important about this, 2,000 years before Mahaprabhu, was that love is a key to understanding Krishna. 
that already we have Radha mentioned in this poem and the loving relationship between them. Now be careful, as Gurudev explained to me yesterday, you don't have Manjari Bhav in this poem. This comes with Mahaprabhu. So you don't have the loving pastime and you don't have these love games and the, and the tension and you don't have the Manjari activity of, of cultivating the love. But you do have already the sign that the relation to God is only possible through uh, divine love. So with that, I think I'm going to stop for today. There's so many of us here that there's surely some people who want to share or comment or, or question. So I open the floor to you. Or to Gurudev, of course. Вот, ну, у меня такой вопрос возник, знаете, на тему, э, вот он говорил, движущая сила, да, которая вообще всем движет, любовь, да, ну, что вот, но есть же ведь еще и ненависть, да, как, знаете, как обратная сторона, не любовь, ведь это же и ненависть как бы двигает, да, скажем, нет? Radha Govinda has a question. Uh, he's saying that you mentioned that love is the thing, the thing which is moving everything. But what about hatred? Uh, hatred also is, seems to move people or move something. <laughs> Please, can you wait on this a little bit? Yes, hatred moves <laughs> lots of things, doesn't it? Как Пропупада говорит, те люди, которые, у которых нет веры, они никогда его и не увидят, они не почувствуют его, да? То есть они же живут как бы вне любви, в ненависти. Вот, вот этот момент, ну как бы, если можно уточнить, рады, рады. Пропупада also is saying that persons who are living not in love, but in hatred mostly, they cannot perceive Krishna, they cannot perceive personality of Godhead. Hmm. Thank you. Very good question. The, the second class, we talked about envy because Bhagavad Gita in the first verse of the chapter talks about the requirement of being non-envious in order to see God. Uh, hatred is a displaced kind of love. Hatred is fully, it's love hidden behind false ego. It's uh, a position from which we have forgotten who we are, that is that we are spiritual beings, and that our relation to God is a loving one. So our constitutional position, our very basic position is one of love. And this position is easily, easily clouded and covered by material energy. And the one that Prabhupada talked well, the one that uh, Vasudev talks about, about in Bhagavad Gita is envy. So wanting what one ha another has instead of wanting what another is. So hatred is also the same confusion of having and being. If you really look at the other person and ask who the person is instead of what qualities the person has, then love is unavoidable. Strip the person of the qualities you think are implicit and love is unavoidable. There is one nice example. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. There is one nice example for that, what you both say. This is this arena from Kamsa. 
you know all this story when Kamsa is in Mathura, no? there is this big arena. And in this arena, there was a uh, different uh, friends of uh, Krishna was there, the Gopas, Gopis, and also Kamsa's fighting friends. But they have a different relationship to Krishna. They saw the same Krishna, right? When he was in the arena. Uh, but they have a different uh, feeling to them. Some are there who likes to be God. As example, Kamsa. So he see Krishna as his, wie heißt das, Rivale? Rival. Rival. And the friends, they see Krishna with loving emotions. So you see there are same Krishna, but different emotions. And the main emotion, what is against this love is when one likes to be God and he hates everything what is higher than himself. This is our situation also in this world. We also create, we are here to play God and we like to enjoy because of mercy we got this tendency from him that we get the feeling that we are God. And for this illusion, he used Maya. And we can be in this illusion as long as we like to be. And we can think we are God and all the others are our servants. To change this behave, we have to come in another mood. And this mood is to be the servants and to come close to those who are servants still. Then we get, we can change our life and come out of. And to change our mood, we need to get some faith. From faith, hope comes. And love is coming from the hope. That is also what Gurudev many times reading. Right, Gurudev? So you are talking about Kansa, the story how they are looking to Krishna. Different, different person is looking to Krishna differently. That we explain. You stop that time. And Kangsa, he is in the mood of an enemy because he sees Krishna in this arena as his enemy and his rival because he liked to be God. He liked to be the controller of everything. And so his relationship to Krishna is complete opposite to those of his friends. They like to play with Krishna and love exchanging Krishna. And Kangsa like to kill God. And the gopis like to love him. So you see what a difference is there in the view of the, of the beings how to see the Lord. But both don't see him as God. The friends not see Krishna as, as, as the Lord. Gopis not see him as the Lord. And also Kamsa not see him as the Lord. And we can see there is uh, all has some relationship. 
all based on the relationship, but different interpretations, different moods. And we have to clear up what is our relationship to the Lord and our Swamini. Full of faith, hope, and love. Then we can enter the spiritual abode with a spiritual body and a spiritual relationship. Exchange feelings in the service mood to our Swamini. And feel what they feel. We're changing from Mahamaya to Yoga Maya. This is the goal to come in a rela loving relationship, to see and feel the Prema. That's why we are here. Thank you. Thank you, Tao. Any other thoughts? Утхава, почему сказано, что вот по тексту, четвертый текст в санскрите прям, Говинда Махини, я в своей непроявленной форме пронизываю всю Вселенную, да, все существа пребывают во мне, но я не в них по тексту идет. Вот это вот, что я не в них. Это, это имеется в виду личностный аспект, да? Пусть Удова да, разъяснит. I, uh, yeah, I'll go back to the shloka. Yeah, I had, uh, I had a in-house translation here, so the way I understand it, it's a bit, um, it's a bit uh, strange. But he, uh, Krishna, uh, created the universe as a form. And all the beings that exist, exist in this form. But he does not entirely inhabit the entire universe. So he is, he is the form, but then he only goes partially into the form. He only goes into the form where he wants to go. But all beings have to be in it because they're beings in the universe. So it's due to the fact that the, the, the jivas did not create the universe. He did. I'm all right, if there are no other comments, then we'll stop here. Really glad to see you, at all, uh, see you all. Please feel welcome to take the floor next week when we, when we meet. And I look forward to seeing you all again. It's really a pleasure. So take good care. Rade, rade. Гавинда Махиня, вы можете от два слова благодарности, что вот мои ощущения, можно, да? Удова баба. Вот спасибо большое, скажите, Гавинда Махини, что вот он на, сам, на самом деле мне включил какую-то вот эту медитацию, а вот о вере, вот о ее, знаете, как погрузил вот мой ум, и я чувствую, что это надолго меня. Как бы я до сих пор думаю, я думаю, буду копаться в этом. Что да, вот это, со, 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 знаете, как осознание вот этой веры. То есть вот где-то причинное вот это, и вообще это очень здорово. Я благодарен ему и Гурдеву, и преданным. Рады, рады. Удава immersed him in this meditation of faith from where faith is beginning 
how it is working. So he is saying that I am. I think I will be immersed in this meditation for some time more. So he's very grateful for you and for Gurudev. Radhe Radhe. Oh, nice. Radhe Radhe.